start? Okay. So today we have a uh, Professor Takashi Kigami from University of Tokyo. So he is kind of a leading figure in the field of uh, the research field called artificial life. So and uh, okay, so his background is a statistical physics. And he got PhD in the University of Tokyo Physics Department. Then the, he moved to to the Kyoto University and uh, Kobe University. Then he came back to the uh, University of Tokyo as a full professor. So today he will talk about artificial life and collective intelligence. And also, he's quite a famous artist, internationally famous artist. He has collaborated. Uh, okay, so he's quite a famous artist in uh, uh, noise arts like things. I, I <laughs> so international, but anyway. So today I don't know whether he he's going to perform today it or not. But uh, yeah, please enjoy his talk. Yeah, please. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Jun. Um, <clears throat> for me and Jun, for been with uh, with us uh, with for more than twenty years now. I think yeah, uh, most almost thirty years. Um, Okay, thank you very much for a uh, nice introduction, and uh, I'm very happy to be here as a uh, visiting uh, researcher here in Oi. You know, um, I was uh, expecting like a very sunny and uh, a nice uh, ocean view here, and then actually it was. You know, I I I have been here since uh, the eighth of August, so it's already uh, two months, um, but I haven't seen so many many, many people here like <laughs> this room. Uh, this is my first time, and I'm very excited to, uh, to give a talk in front of many audience. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, artificial life. The introduction is artificial life, and then I'll switch to uh, what my current interest is, um, try to explain it in, uh, in, in connection with uh, what the uh, people in artificial life been thinking, and then what's the concept of artificial life, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so I, I got many questions, what is uh, artificial life is? And uh, my main question to the, uh, my answer to the question is, artificial life is, uh, is about the theory of brain and evolution, right? Well, usually that we, what we <clears throat> answer is that is a computer is a good metaphor of a brain, and then our answer is, well, may or may not, right? And then do we have a CPU, or do we have RAM, or do we have a, a global clock? Of course not. Uh, so what is, the, what is the good metaphor? So that's one of the, uh, <clears throat> the question that we usually ask in, in this community. And uh, what is individuality is another big question in, in this field. So Darwin and evolution assumes the object of selection is um, individual, right? But uh, what's the definition of individuality is? And I don't think we have a, a definite answer to this, and we don't have any definite question, uh, definition of this. So, uh, so this research is about, you know, how we can understand individuality, and then what is the evolution of individuality is. And this question is uh, one of my uh, big um, obsessions since I was in Santa Fe Institute like uh, 30 years ago now. Uh, that the Leo Bass and Walter Fontana have been asking this question that what is the evolution of individuality is. Right? And then why this one is a big question is because, uh, um, first question is because uh, I think everybody knows John Conway's uh, Game of Life. Does, you don't know if anyone knows this, right? Of course, I, I hope so. Um, but I can even show some of this. Uh, So it's gone, so I cannot show this. Uh, wait a minute. Ah, yes, I can show this. Yeah, for example, like uh, the game of life is uh, the grid, uh, the game, right? It's black and white. The white is a uh, life state, and then black is a uh, dead state, right? So when the the white cell is surrounded by exactly the three states of a living cell, then uh, the black cell becomes white. 
And if the white cell is surrounded by two or three uh, living states, and it continues to be uh, in the same state, right? But otherwise, it's going to be the dead state. That's what the very simple uh, living systems are uh, the, the game, right? Then if you simulate this, like this way, uh, some, some crowded thing, but uh, you can see there, right? I mean, of course, you know, um, like this. This is what we call glider, our uh, favorite creature, right? So this one too, and right? this one too. So what are these? These are the, the little uh, glider, or we can call it a soliton, or some you know moving things. So uh, this is where the artificial life actually started, because people are fascinated with this idea of glider and how you can find it and how you can play around with it, right? Then. But actually, but the John Conway doesn't like it, you know. So he said, don't ask me about the game of life, right? So we invited him to uh, as a keynote speaker in 2014 in New York. And he said, okay, guys, don't ask me about the game of life, right? But that's what the people want to ask about, right? So that was, a, that was interesting, but uh, he doesn't like it because the game of life is very deterministic, right? The game of life, it doesn't stochastic or deterministic. Uh, it, it's very much deterministic. But he also said, don't use the stochastic equations because it's not also, you cannot describe life. In order to describe life, you have to not use the deterministic rule, not use the stochastic rule, but you have to use the indeterministic one. But what is it? You know, we don't know it. Right? So that the people are very much, you know, uh, uh, and we ask, actually, I asked him, so what do you think of the game of life? And he was so pissed off against me. I said, I don't know what, what the, but anyway, so that's what uh, we, we started, you know, playing around the game of life. But the glider is, whether the concept of glider is came up from his John Conway's game of life. But of course, you know, it's not easy to uh, translate the game of life into a chemical reaction. Right? So uh, there's a way to do this. And then one of the things that we're doing is like um, the Gray Scott model. It's a very simple uh, two components chemical system. But as you can see here, right, they can replicate and they can move around. So the, the, the Gray Scott model in the 2D space that they can create a glider, which I, uh, I mean, actually, we have to put the third comp components to this, and then it can start to move around which uh, uh, the Tom Forrest here in OIST, the, we wrote a paper on this with Nathaniel uh, Vago. So this Gray Scott model can be this um, continuous version of Game of Life and then the glider, we think. But also um, there are some interesting, um, uh, recently that, that we have very nice, um, simulation of the continuous version. Of
Okay. Then I thought, you know, um, maybe I should make it in a real state, right? The first one was a very discrete space and time and state uh, cell automata that you can see the glider. And the second one is a continuous state, continuous time, but and then continuous um, space and time and then also a state. But it's not still in a real world. So that I try to make uh, the living glider, right? The real chemical reaction that can generate glider. That was I started working with uh, Martin Hanzek. He's now in Trento of University of Trento, Italy. So this is the oleic anhydride put in high pH water. Then looking through the microscope and about 0.1 micrometers, uh, millimeters, that you can see this uh, droplet is formulated and then start to move around. So I was so uh, surprised and I was fascinated with this idea that, okay, this chemical reaction is not always happening in a global space, but it's a localized and then start to move around. And actually uh, this droplet is sensitive to the environmental pH gradient so that they can climb up and then sometimes they go back because they understand the gradient of the pH. So, so there are three different ways to model gliders. And the question is whether this is life or not. Well, we can say that, okay, okay, we already made a life, so uh, we don't have to do anything more, right? But still, I don't think this one is not uh, life. But also, I, I recently, I did uh, this simple uh, react chemical reaction. This is a, a acid saturated with ACS, so it's different components. But still, you can see a different, a different droplet is moving around and interacting with each other, and different, uh, uh, initial configuration, if you put this way, or if you put that way, and then you can make a different droplet. So the droplet is not only one kind, but there are many different kinds of droplets that you can generate even in a chemical reaction. So that uh, there's a bunch of different types of gliders like in the game of life. So it's more or less, this one is corresponding to the game of life in the real world. However, that the, of course the biologists never satisfied with this kind of experiment, right? They say, well, it's just a chemical reaction. So why you, why you call it life, right? And then actually my, my friend, uh, Stuart Bart, uh, Stuart Ballet in Caltech, and he said, it's not life, it's, we have to call it life, right? So different sparing. So that's what, whether we artificial life is, is currently in, in the state. But then uh, I remember in 2009 in adaptive behavior, uh, it's, a, it's a journal that there's a, a Barbara Webb, uh, she, is a, uh, she studies the cockro uh, cro uh, cro cockroaches or croc I mean, the small insect. And then here that she wrote animals versus animal uh, paper. Uh, why not model the real one? Why, why, why you are stuff, you know, playing around with some, some strange toy model? That's what she said. So there's a bunch of paper that we wrote. And I also, I also wrote a paper there, like rehabil rehabilitating biology as a, natural history, that's my uh, answer to Barbara's paper. So it's so difficult to convince biologists. I don't have to, but it's so difficult to convince biologists to understand. You don't have to really think cell and DNA, but you really can study something else, but still can understand the living system, I think. And then I remember that uh, one of the conference that uh, the big professor in biochemistry came to the conference and he said, Okay, I totally understand what's happening in the cell microchemical state and then things. So don't ask me what is life or what is consciousness. I, I understand that these, these are neuro, neurons are connected with each other, right? So if you don't ask me what is consciousness, I'm very happy, right? So think there is no life, there is no consciousness, then everybody is so happy. That's exactly what he said in the conference. I mean, well, actually, you know, Studying a neural network is fine, but the studying consciousness is different. It's very difficult, right? And then also what is life is a big question and people cannot answer to it, but people can study biochemical processes. So it's a way different and what, how to bridge the gap is a big question. That's what the obsession about artificial life, of course. And then uh, I remember in 2002 that uh, uh, Brooks, 
well, he's the famous guy that he made, he made a Roomba, right? I have two Roomba in my house. And then Roomba is quite popular, in, especially in Spain and Japan. I don't know why in Spain is so popular, but the Roomba, and when he said he made a Roomba, then we said, so this is the first application of artificial life ideas. So now that life, artificial life comes to in the real world. But he said, and then we did, I discussed with him that, you know, but it's not still life, he said. Oh, Takashi, but this is not life yet, right? The robot never becomes life, or your com com computer simulation never becomes life. So what's missing there, right? There's something is totally missing in our computer simulations or uh, making robots. And he said, maybe the parameters are wrong because like, uh, we have uh, tons of parameters of the computer simulation, right? These days, like, uh, I don't know, more than 1,000 or 2,000 parameters. So, <clears throat> But we really have to adjust the parameters. That's the trick, that's what he said. Well, maybe the complexity threshold is lower enough, right? Because at that time, we don't have a, a deep learning. And then the models are so simple. And he said, okay, the complexity is low, still low. That we have to put more complex, more complex uh, things. Then we can have uh, uh, the real living system. Or maybe the lacking of computer power. Computing power now is, I think it is getting better and better, right? Everybody is using GPU and then supercomputers, so that um, maybe this can be overcome. But of course, maybe we, we're missing something fundamental, like uh, Tom's eruption theory. I don't know. Uh, some missing part is that we need to understand what is life. So um, we call um, this is Brooks, by the way. So I invited him to the uh, to the conference, artificial life conference in 2018. Then. I asked him, why don't you talk about your uh, missing one, missing piece? And then we call it Brooks juice, right? So the question is, what is Brooks juice? That's the artificial life you know, challenge. We have to find the Brooks juice. And once we found it, and then we can put it in our robot, then the robot becomes alive. Right? So the question is, what is, what is Brooks juice is the thing that we have to understand. But then, you know, uh, for me, been, so we've been discussing, you know, what is uh, Brooks juice and actually he didn't know we call it Brooks juice. So he was surprised. But anyway, so the juice is a bit uh, difficult to find by just, you know, looking at the computer simulations and, and then just swimming in the ocean, right? So we really have to do something else so that in considering the life itself, maybe that the evolution must be taken seriously, right? Life is always with evolution, evolution, evolutionary processes. So that we decided to devise a minimal experiment, which is still sufficiently complex enough, but we can discuss uh, self reproduction and can discuss individualities and evolutionary processes. And then what is it? That's the thing that I'm, I want to discuss in, in the rest of the time. Okay. Um, so my choice is uh, tetrahymena. I don't know whether this one is uh, the, the best uh, material or not, but I want to discuss, uh, I want to study this tetrahymena. Um, this, and then thanks to uh, current technology that we can identify each individual and then tracking them for many, many hours. And that's the, the current technology that I can use. So even though there are the thousands of, of, of biological agents that we can track, identify tracking with a UNET or some other uh, deep neural network that we can use. Right. And then I also, I remember one of the students that I, one of the book that I read is that saying that uh, conditional learning is possible with a, with a protozoa, with a, you know, relative of, of, of uh, tetrahymena that uh, if this uh, protozoa is conditioned with uh, 500 hertz, it's followed by electric shock, and it's controlled with 100 hertz, it's followed by nothing. Right? But then he immediately, or he or she immediately understood, understand that once you got the 500 hertz, that you are expecting electric shock is coming, right? So that uh, they start to trembling and then moving first. But when there's a hundred health, he can be relieved, right? He doesn't have any extra shock. So 
So this is already possible even with the, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> um, conditional stimulus. And I think, I don't know why, but maybe the chemical network inside the protozoa is also like a neural network can do um, reinforcement learning and it can learn something, can memorize something. So which I thought was fascinating, you know, even the, like a, this small little thing with a chemical network inside, then they can learn and memorize things. And actually what the tetrahymena is, is, is sensing is the chemical substance is released from the other, uh, other uh, individual so that he knows where the other one is. That's one thing. And then also um, there's a two cycles, right? Actually the, the, the tetrahymena has a six sex, right? six different sex. We have only two, but they have six, uh, they, have, they have seven, right? So, uh, so we just used one type. So there is no uh, sexual cycle, but we can, we are only looking at the vegetative cycle so that there is no uh, sexual recombination, but there's only uh, 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 self dividing by self, right? That's the experiment that we are going to look at. Sorry. And this, uh, this is the experimental setup. Of course, I'm not a biologist so that I cannot do this. But uh, I have a collaborator in Hidosaki University. He's um, um, <clears throat> Professor Kashiwagi that uh, he set up this one with the microscope and then put EDMS on the <clears throat> uh, heating up uh, plate so that uh, you, can, you can observe and uh, you, you can record all those uh, tetrahymena moving around under the microscope. So it's a very simple experiment, but it's uh, uh, but it's very difficult uh, to do it more precisely, right? And then you say that the P this PDMS that we put up 0.4 micrometer di diameter hole so that we can put uh, oxygen and then also uh, food from those uh, poles so that the trahymena is not starving. They can uh, get oxygen, fresh oxygen and fresh food. So this one is what it looks like. So these are the moving around. Right. So we have to, we can identify them and we can track them for many, many hours. And then we use a Baxter algorithm and then some package from NIH so that we can identify which one is which, how they move around so that we can calculate uh, kinetic energy and then, you know, uh, angular momentum and all these things that we want to understand from the uh, physical point of view, physics point of view. The one of the things that I'm uh, interested in is there's the two exactly the same gene, genotype and then the same number of the, of the individuals, but this one and this one behaves differently, right? We pick up from the same gene pool and then put in the, in the same uh, different well, a petri dish, and then observe. But this one is the, uh, it's not so much kinky, right? But this one is the more active. So what makes this one is, is not so active and this one is very Genki, right? So we have to understand what the Genki is coming from. Is from, from interactions? Is it from something else? So that's one of the, I, actually many biologists, my friend said, okay, I am doing exactly the same conditions, but even though this petri dish and this petri dish is different and that's the common sense that people know it. So I was wondering, you know, why this one happens? And also, even the, the same genotype makes phenotype. Of course, it's a, everybody knows that right now, there's a one too many mapping, even though there's a only one genotype, but still there are many phenotypes that can exist. The question is, what is the phenotype of tetrahymena? The question of tetrahymena, and then one of the uh, thing is that because it's a behavior is different, right? So how we can take like a phenotype as a kinetic energy distribution because uh, my background is, is statistical physics. So one of the things that I can do is, okay, why don't you just look at the kind of, you know, energy distribution of the, the of this uh, tetrahymena. So that's what we did. So this is uh, taking a logarithmic scale and this is the energy. So um, if this is a Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution, 
then it should be a straight line right? because it's a logarithmic scale and this is the energy. Right? So if this is, is a linear, then you say, okay, uh, tetrahymena is just a Boltzmann particle. Right? Maybe then it's gonna be not so much interesting. But fortunately, there are different types. Right? Uh, it doesn't look like Maxwell Boltzmann in distribution. Right? So, um, and then also when you have a many cells, like uh, eight cells in the same petri dish, uh, sometimes they are synchronized and they're going to the same distribution, but it's not a linear uh, form. So maybe this is something else, but it's also some of the cells individuals have the different forms and many, everybody has a different forms. So, so it also depends on the case. And then if you like equations, I, by the way, I don't like equations, right? So, but, uh, usually the people say, okay, you know, these are small microbes, uh, just a random Brownian motion, right? So you can describe it with the Foucault-Frank equations. And if it obeys the Foucault-Frank equation, then the distribution becomes like a Maxwell Boltzmann uh, role. Okay, so I was uh, very much afraid of, you know, this can be applicable to my little creatures, but fortunately not, right? So it's something else. Um, so one of the one of the techniques that I use, it's a very simple technique. I think everybody uses it right now, but uh, it's, it's called Kalbach Liber uh, divergence. Well, you can uh, symmetrize is uh, Shannon, Janssen Shannon divergence is that uh, if you have two different distributions and then whether they are similar or not can be can be measured by this uh, simple formula like. Uh, taking a logarithm of P over Q, then you can measure quantitatively how, how much different this, uh, pro, uh, this distribution and the other distribution is. So if it's exactly the same, then P, uh, Kalbach Liber or Jensen Shannon Liber equals zero, and it's very different, and it becomes 0.6 or something. So that uh, this differences can be measured by uh, computing this one, which is the Kalbach Liber distribution. Okay. So um, first of all, I'm looking into uh, these are the two different. Uh, this is the reference. Right? So this is one, just one uh, uh, individual in the one petri dish, and then computing uh, the distances. I mean the uh, differences between the. Uh, the, the kinetic energy distribution with the two different uh, individuals, which is of course it's independent because it's in different dish, dish, different dish, but still you can compare with this one and this one. And then if you take a swarm plot, swarm plot is just plotting all this uh, uh, Kalbach Leibler uh, point, then it's distributed like this. But once you have um, uh, just two, sorry, I, I, I made a mistake here. But there's two uh, individuals in the one petri dish, three uh, individuals in the one petri dish, four individuals in the one petri dish. Then if you increase that, then the JST goes up, means that more individuals in the well, uh, in the petri dish, more diversity that you can see. So however, comparing with this one, which is totally independent, it's different. So maybe there's some, some kind of interaction that exists. So we are afraid of that, even though we, are, we put different individuals in the same petri dish, and then I don't know whether they are interacting with each other or not, but it looks like there are some, some correlations. Now we measure like a special correlations, the two point correlations, and there is a, some positive value. So that there is a correlation, so that there is an interaction in there. But as, a, as a each petri dish, um, they are converging into some point so that the, each petri dish has a different variety, but the individual is more, has more, about, more diversity. I think it's difficult to say, but this is converging because of the central limit theorem, I think, because it's uh, divided by those numbers by uh, eight, so on eight, you have seven, so that it's uh, averaging over by the number becomes more uh, stabilizing this behavior. But the message from here is that there are the interactions, and more uh, individuals in the same uh, petri dish. There is a more distribution, di different distribution of the kinetic energy that we can observe. Okay. So, 
So now we can come to the uh, replication hypervisor. In a repeating case that we can also see, uh, this one is interesting now. So that this is here in this time timeline. Once they um, So this guy is a little bit inactive, right? Then start to replicate. So when they replicate, they start, they are slowing down and they almost stop. Then they replicate and then start to uh, move around again. Well, still they are sort of uh, hanging around each other, but maybe they is just going out and they start to uh, interrupt the breathing. So we look into this, uh, this is all only the X coordinate because we have a uh, 2D space. And then also we are only, only taking the X coordinate. And then this one is the first individual and then divide it into two. And this is the time uh, X coordinate of one cell and then second one. And this one is dividing into two cells for each other, right? And then this one goes to like a, the final idea the eight individuals that exist, then we put the time series of X coordinate. And then, well, you, you cannot say anything, but uh, this is about 14 hours that we can have this one. However, when you look at the kinetic energy distribution, this is the first one, first generation, this is the second generation, the third generation, this is the fourth generation. I don't know, but this one and this one is similar, right? And it's, <laughs> It's, it, it looks like the same, right? I mean, this one is also. So maybe this kinetic energy distribution is inherited to the offspring. So that's, that's uh, from our observation. But when you see this one, the different individual, this is first generation, this is the second, this is the third generation, this is the fourth generation. See the energy distribution is, 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 is similar, right? There's the DN, there's no, we, we calculated, but there's no mutation happens. So DNA is exactly the same. Still, the phenotype, there's something is inherited from, from the parent to the offspring. And then again, so this is the third example that this is the first one. And then you see, it's similar. So there is some inherited from the parent to the offspring to the, to the third generation, fourth generation. So maybe this kinetic energy distribution can be the candidate of a phenotype of, of this uh, tetrahymena. And um, so, so this one, this one, this one. So the question can be, is the kinetic energy distribution the phenotype that it causes mutation? Yes, actually there are the mutations means that this distribution is changing. As, as you can see here, this has more flat here, but it's more smooth here. Right? And then it's, uh, it's a different, right? And then also it's a different from whether this one is coming from this guy or this guy is coming from this one, right? So these are the nephews, right? And th these are the brothers, but these are the nephews. And then, then there, there, this is, if the dif distance is, is increasing in, in terms of uh, generation, then also the phenotypic variation can be generated, I think. So again, of course, we can measure them by the Kabak Libra of uh, Jensen Shannon, right? Then we can see like this diagram. So this is the, uh, so this one is the same. So this first one is the first generation, the second generation, third generation, fourth generation. Fourth generation has eight individuals, third generation has four individuals. And second one has a two individuals. And first one is of course it's one, just one individual, right? And then the color means that whether they are similar or not, this kinetic energy is, right? And then it's, it's dark one is that exactly the same. And if it's the bright one is, is, is very different, right? So uh, when you see this, that for oh, this one, first generation and second generation is very similar, right? However, second generation, third and fourth is very different, right? So, there's the inherited from first one to second one, but there's no inheritance happens from the second one to third one. However, from the third one to fourth one, again, there's a very big uh, blue square means that 
from the third one to fourth one, the inheritance still uh, emerges again, right? However, when you see this, the first one and fourth one is very different, right? Because it's right. So even though this one is, uh, is inheriting something and this one is inheriting something, but uh, what is inherited is different from this form part and this part. And you see here, so the, the collective within the same generation, they have a similar uh, distribution, right? However, there is no inheritance. So it's uh, quite complicated in a way that uh, sometimes it, it is inherited, but sometimes it is not. Also, there's a collective effect so that uh, in the same generation, they seem to have, sometimes they seem to have the same kinetic energy distribution, but there's no inheritance from the previous generation. And an interesting point is, for example, like, like uh, uh, this one, this from the second to third to fourth, they tend to have a similar one, but uh, this nephew one, uh, the first one cannot, the kinetic energy of the first generation is not inherited to the, to the, uh, to the latter, uh, later you know, generation, but the, the, this one has a quite, uh, this one is quite nicely uh, inherited. So this is a, the one gen individual from the second generation, uh, its kinetic energy is, uh, is inherited to, to the third one and fourth generation. However, uh, the second individual of the second generation, its kinetic energy is not similar to, to the third and fourth generation. So even though it's from the, sec the same second generation, but the inheritance, the strength of inheritance is different from individual to individual. So um, the final one is that the comparison of, of this, the, the, the individuals starting from the same, uh, the, the common ancestor, and then same, gen, same genotype, but randomly uh, sampled from the two and then compared with it. I mean, like this. So this one is the eight reproduced cell from the single cell. This one is. And this one, the eight cell from the same coronal population, but it's, they don't have any common uh, parents, right? You see, so, so this one is uh, they from the same, uh, what we can call it, Luca, right? The same ancestor at, at the beginning, but this one is somewhere, but uh, both of them have the same genotype, right? So the question is whether those behavior is the same or not. And then interestingly, if you, if you look at it carefully, they are different. And then actually, uh, the, the my, my collaborator, Kachan Sensei, said, okay, when you look at, I thought there was something wrong, but uh, this one is start to rotate at the same time. I don't know how, how, what kind of you know, synchronization effect that this one makes possible. And then she, many times as she saw like this one, right? Only from the, from the population where the only single ancestor can generate all of them. And then they have this kind of interesting behavior. So maybe there's some, some, some strange correlation in, in the population where there is only one, the same ancestor that they have. So there's another technique, which is also, um, which is also quite uh, popular. But uh, it's a, it is called multidimensional scaling. I think, I hope everybody knows this. But uh, basically what you can do is pick up some distance, this one and this one as, as measured by distance. Uh, you can have the distance between this one. Then, uh, but this point and this point is closer, but this point and this point is much farther on, right? So measure this um, uh, matrix of distance and then projecting onto a uh, 2D space with, with uh, maintaining uh, the distance relationship. That's possible. So uh, if it, this one is like a Euclid distance, then it's more like a PCA analysis. But you can do it, you can generalize this one to the multidimensional scaling, right? So uh, we can use, uh, we, I used a uh, distance by the uh, Kalbach Libra uh, distances between two, two individuals, right? So that the uh, individuals can be mapped onto uh, 2D space by, but also preserving the distance between the two, measured by the JST and uh, Kalbach library distances. Okay, 
of each time scale. I mean, that's, I, I should be careful. So each time, each, oh my God, each two minutes that I calculate Karabakh uh, Libra distributions and then uh, um, <clears throat> calculate the JSP with the other uh, time series. So time series is, is segmented into two minutes uh, uh, pieces, then calculating uh, kinetic energy distribution and then also uh, angular momentum distribution over this segment, right? Then comparing with the other uh, other one, then if it's uh, it's so it's very similar and it's zero, it's it's, it's almost uh, comes to the same point. But if it's very different, they are plotting at a very different point. Um, so mapping into the uh, multi-dimensional scale <coughs> scaling, then you can see that um, if it's very if it's stopping almost stopping because of they are preparing for for replicating uh, phase, then it's coming to here, right? But if it's uh, just moving straight and fast movement, they go to the different edge. And then in the middle, it's, it's slow or in the middle speed, and then they're not so much rotating, but it's, then it comes to uh, in this area. So I um, <clears throat> computed, so, this one is a uh, three three examples that I saw. I, I I have I have demonstrated. This is the first one, and then divided into two, dividing into four, and then this is a, a fourth generation. Right? So we have a um, here that we have a, a eight trajectories. We have a four trajectories. We have two trajectories. There's one trajectory. Then they are moving in an MD space, like this way. So comparing with this, I don't know how they they are different. So it's not a kinetic energy distribution, but uh, a little bit different, right? But we don't see so much a difference between those three. However, when you when you're comparing with uh, uh, randomly um, sampled individuals, both of them, this one has eight individuals, this one has four individuals, this one has four individuals, five, six, and eight, then, uh, when you're picking up from the randomly from the pool, they stick to here, right? They never, uh, they just, you know, uh, in the middle, they don't stop, they don't uh, move fast, but they just, you know, uh, making a little uh, point on here. However, when you, the ensemble is from the same ancestor, they're moving quite globally, right? Their behavior is more rich. And then I still don't know why, but the one reason is, so I said, Population created by the sequential division of a single individual has a greater diversity of movement patterns than the population of randomly selected individuals. Perhaps due to the disparate cell cycles or other form of character. So once they are duplicating and replicating, their cell cycles are in the same phase. But once you are uh, randomly picking up from the gene pool, they tend to have different cell cycles. That's the, our, our guess. We try to understand whether that that I guess is true or not by uh, using a RNA sequence, uh, single cell RNA sequence. That maybe there we can see why why this is more rich and why this is not. But anyway, so uh, the, this petri dish uh, starting from the single cell or petri dish randomly picking up from uh, from other pool, even though they have same gene genotype, but the, their behavior is very different. So the plasticity, when I say plasticity, is not a single uh, individual's uh, uh, effect, but also it's a collective behavior. The plasticity, I mean, no, no, the pheno phenotype is not created by the individual only, but the phenotype of the individual is also affected by the collective of other phenotypes. So I think it's, it's very, um, <clears throat> that point is interesting. And also finally, that um, instead of from the, so again, this is a Kalbach library, and this one is a Kalbach library of the unrelated individual. And this one is the related because it's from the two to four to eight. And then they are more similar, right? Their kinetic energy is more similar, but you see here that kinetic energy is different. So this is the point one, and this is point one. So their behavior is much more similar to each other, and then almost exactly the same. Because my guess is that in case of uh, 
population which is created from the single cell, maybe there's no strong interruption because the chemical secreted from this individual is the same as the chemical secreted from other individuals because they are they, they are in the same they, they are in a, they are relative and then also they are replicating in in, in phase so that the, maybe the same cycle is sort of synchronized I think but if you're picking up from the random pool maybe their cell cycles are different so that their behavior is strongly interrupting uh, strongly uh, sometimes it's correlated but sometimes it's very uh, not correlated because of the interaction is not used for synchronization, but the interaction between the cells is maybe try not to synchronize. So their, be their behavior becomes more sort of um, different. So the diversity is coming from also from the unrelated uh, pituitary. That's so far, so I cannot conclude that uh, behavior, that observation, but the more discussion is that the first one is that maybe the kinetic distribution is, is, is a good as a phenotype. And then also when I when we started this work, I noticed that uh, a libeler in Princeton, the United States, that he also already uh, uh, did a similar experiment, but without any interaction between the individual. That's the difference. And then he said that the kinetic energy, kinetic uh, speed, and also angular momentum, he thinks can be the candidate for the for the phenotype, but we think that the kinetic energy distribution is one of the characteristic of a phenotype, uh, phenotype of the individual. Also, there's a phenotype in the variation, which is suppressed by the cell interaction in both homo and hetero population. So there's a uh, phenotype uh, variation that exists, but maybe uh, because of the population inter interaction between cells, uh, between individuals, sometimes phenotype is, is di different. So the mutation is not caused by uh, DNA with uh, replacing um, <clears throat> with some other um, uh, sequences, but this phenotype variation is coming from the interaction in a macro level, right? And then third one is that uh, this is coherent, but the rich dynamics in homo are comparing with the hetero, right? So when it is uh, created from the same ancestor, then their population is becomes more coherent, but as you see in the MDS space, they are moving around quite uh, widely. So uh, the dynamics become the rich, rich in the sense that the population is more low dimensional dynamical system, I'm not sure. But in a hetero uh, population, hetero in a sense that hetero over cell cycle with the same gene, maybe because of this different cell cycles that the uh, behavior is more, um, it's not so much rich, but this point is I, I we really have to think again and again. We we tested things, but we, we still cannot come to the the definite conclusion. Of this. <clears throat> but again, it's interesting point is that the heritability and the variability is, is quite correlated, right? And then without thinking DNA or without thinking any you know the, the actual mutation, but still we have a um, when it can be heritability can happen, and then how the variability emerges by looking into the interaction between the individuals. So, uh, so this is actually this is what the tetrahymenides. So I'm pretty much interested in um, uh, then you know uh, identifying individuals and then tracking everything, and then maybe it can change the way that we think what is evolution, and then maybe if uh, we are lucky enough that we can update the Darwin and evolutionary theory. And then what I wrote, I wrote here is suppose that uh, people want to know, so, but you said co collective intelligence, what is, where is collective, collective intelligence, right? So, so I think, well, in order to understand what is the collective intelligence of the collectiveness, maybe we have to look, we have to open up the environment. And then open environment is very important for understanding the collective behavior, I think. The collective intelligence can be only understood by coupling with the open environment. That's what we are doing. So one of the things, so I don't go into the detail, but this is the large scale web services, and then it's a social tagging services. Then maybe the tag becomes like an individual that is uh, replicating, but it's also mutating to others and then interacting with each other. So uh, this is the one example. And this is um, uh, 
ant behavior. Uh, we are using a unit that identifying and tracking. Then we are making a food portion for it connecting to this part. So you can see you can int see interesting uh, interactions and then uh, role differentiation can happen only when you are coupling. Uh, this nest is coupling the open environment. Some other thing is that uh, we are tracking honeybees. This time we are putting QR code on its back. Thousands of bees in a honey, uh, beehive. Then op there is only one layer and put in front of the video camera, right? Then uh, after two days, you open up the door so the bees can go out and then come back. So this is uh, done by Gene Robinson and his group in Auburn Champaign in the United States. And then we are collaborating with them to see what's happen, what happens there. And one of the interesting points that I found, again, is kinetic energy. But uh, when we compute the kinetic energy of each individual, before the door opens, so this one is a closed, closed uh, room, then there is a bursting behavior happens. But after you open the door, this Bursting behavior becomes more periodic, right? And this, the green one is the entropy that I calculated. And the entropy is related to the uh, load differentiation of the, of the beehive. And then differentiation happens when you open the door. So my, my, my guess is that if you open the door and then there's an open environment, which you cannot make a, a good model of it, then the information coming from the environment to the hive. This information is the cause of um, role differentiation in the honey hive. So that series is, is, is kind of hypothesis, but as you know that uh, in function of thermodynamics, I don't know whether that is connected to this one or not, but the information thermodynamics tells us that the correlation between the system and the environment is very important. And we can measure it by the mutual information, and then it can be added as a third term to the to the first or first of the thermodynamics. So maybe this uh, coupling with the open environment can, you know, drive us to understand what is the collective intelligence in this um, in this system. But uh, again, I said, you know, uh, we already have a very interesting um, phenomena without having any. Um, and DNA cell, but still, you know, it's an interesting heredity and an interesting vari variation can happen in, 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 in a smaller time scale so that uh, they can add something to the evolutionary theory so that maybe we can uh, understand in details of Darwinian theory. Because at the time, Darwin didn't know this microbes uh, evolutionary processes, but now that we know it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, are there any questions, discussion? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, what uh, is your definition of open environment? So, the like a petri dish uh, looks to me like a closed yeah, yeah, environment. Yeah, yeah. So, this one has, doesn't have any open environment. Uh -huh. So, uh, in order to understand the, the actual collective intelligence, you mm -hmm. really have to Coupled with a couple with the open environment. Mm. So, like a, yeah. there's a flower, there are complex something. So, is the earth uh, like open environment or is it closed? Uh, which ant? An uh, earth. Uh, earth. One planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big um, question. So, I, I think it's uh, this um, earth. Yeah. The earth itself is a closed system, right? Yeah. Because it's uh, it's a, in the universe. So there's not coupling with other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this sense, that the complexity or the intelligence is limited. <laughs> yeah. That's my, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit too much to say about this, but uh, yeah, you're right. So, the earth itself, mm -hmm. the only the energy is coming from the sun, mm -hmm. and it's now no more, uh, you know, a flow, uh, the information flow is coming from other, well, maybe the alien is coming so that uh, the <laughs> information flow, but mm -hmm. otherwise, I don't think there is a, uh, yeah, maybe it's not just the open or close, the degree of openness. Uh, yeah, the, yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes, you're right. All right thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
so also thinking like on this planetary scale, uh, I, I'm really interested when I hear at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, Eric Smith is talking about metabolism uh, and, uh, and the origin of life. And, uh, and he says that the Krebs cycle is like a hurricane. And it's like a, the hurricane is a, a dissipative process that like moves energy along this strong mm -hmm. energy gradient, this strong difference. And so uh, I hear him saying uh, I, that like uh, life, uh, maybe this is not the Brooks juice, but maybe this is a component of, of it. It's that uh, it's this process that, uh, uh, efficiently, you know, kind of like dissipates energy across this, uh, this gradient. Uh, I wonder if you, if you consider metabolism. Uh... Yeah, well, for tetrahymena, there's a met metabolic cycle inside already, right? So we don't have to think about the metabolic cycle, but uh, for the, for the chemical reaction, that we, so for the, really the first one, we don't play with it. Yeah, you, you do have a very simple chemical um, reaction there. Yeah, this one too, and this one too. So the, the simple chemical reaction is there. So I don't know whether you can call it a metabolic cycle, but it's uh, taking up the chemical from outside and having chemicals and then making a membrane. And then because of the membrane that this one can move, then again, they can take uh, chemicals from outside. So uh, there is a feedback going on between the cell and then environment. So uh, that can be the minimal metabolic cycle, I think. Yeah, yeah, because like Eric Smith and Moravec, uh, that they discuss like a reverse TCA cycle can be the first uh, metabolic cycle that we can find in the origin of life, right? So uh, it's possible that we can replace this simple Grayscott model with a TCA, reverse TCA cycle and then put into this one. However, do you think you can understand what is life or do you think that becomes life? My, my fear is I don't think so. Maybe this, even if we replace Grayscott reaction with the reverse TCA cycle, but still we can have this kind of behavior, but we don't think that this one is, is, is the life itself. It's something else I think is, is missing here. So, um, so that's what I'm saying is that uh, maybe the infinite complexity of the environment coupling with it, there is the information flow and that might explain how the life is life emerges, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks uh, for the talk. Um, I'm a biologist. And so in biology, we usually define life with like these tick boxes. And we say, is it check off if, check off, if you can check off all the boxes, it's alive. And so are, are those boxes different in different fields? Like in your field, how how do you define what life is and, and does that differ from how other fields define what life is? Hmm. I mean, so, so what's the definition of, of life in artificial life? Like how do you, in the beginning you were saying, is this alive? Like is the Roomba alive? Hmm. I would say, of course not, it can't, it can't reproduce. <laughs> right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't, you can't check off that box. But I mean, do, do other fields have different definitions of, of life in order to define what's alive and what's not. 
but uh, uh, my, my, from my experience, you know, the biologists never care whether they have the life or not, right? I, I ask many, you know, researchers studying biology, and if I ask, what do you think his life is? And they say, what? So here it is, right? So uh, they don't really want to understand what they want to define what life is, because that's exactly what they are working with, right? If somebody, some, if one day somebody comes to, to the research, to, to, to that researcher and says, okay, what you're doing is just a polymer, then there's nothing to do with life. Then do you think he's going to give up his research? I mean, so I think, you know, uh, the what is the life kind of question is only for physicists or computer scientists because they are very much, you know, uh, uh, you know, embarrassed with this idea. But uh, for the biologists, what the life is just they can touch, they can see in the test tube, uh, they can, you know, do some experiment. That's kind of my bi bias, but uh, what, what, what do you think? I mean, in intro biology textbooks, like the first page tells you what life is. And it tells you it must have these particular qualities. And if it doesn't have all of them, like viruses don't have one or two of them. So it's not so clear like whether viruses are alive or not. There's a debate. Some people would say there's no debate. Some people would say there is a debate. Uh, and, and some people would say some of those checkboxes don't belong. But I mean, they do exist. There is a list um, that changes over time, as, as it probably should. Yeah. Uh, but I think biologists often think about what, what's alive and what's not like things that just like replication in and of itself does not mean life. I mean, crystals replicate, right? So, I mean, uh, there, there, you have to have a number of different categories that you can check off in order to call something alive. I, I think what, what those are, I don't think are, are decided at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, well, uh, I can take your point. That's why I said, you know, artificial life is all about, uh, you know, about brain and evolution brain, you know, if you ask people that what is consciousness, and I don't think brain scientists can, can answer to that question, right? Because they understand the neurons and they can, they understand how the neuron is connected to the others. But if I ask, so what is consciousness? I mean, they say, well, you know, um, may, may neural like exist, right, emerging from neurons. So the emergence is something that we don't understand yet, right? The life itself is also the same thing. We, don't, we can understand the biochemical reactions, connections, and network. But if somebody asks, so what is life? Then, you know, there's no simple answer to that, right? So, um, yeah, you're right. So, uh, I, there's a bunch of this, of the properties that one of the definitions of life. But still, you know, because my background is physicist, physics, so that uh, we are still thinking that maybe there's a missing fundamental principle that creates life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I mentioned about the, the distribution of kinetic energy is some sort of phenotype and uh, mm -hmm. remember in, in your examples, uh, sometimes uh, it looks like inheritable, but in other cases it's not. Yeah. I'm wondering, for me it looks like uh, the kinetic energy distribution is uh, like a continuous trace whose variation is influenced by both genetic and non-genetic factors. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas like uh, how inheritable the kinetic kinetic energy distribution is. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, I, I cannot answer properly to that question. But uh, I think um, if the cell system can, you know, allocate energy in his lifespan, uh -huh. then the kinetic energy is a result of allocation scheduling mm. of its energy. Right. So that's why they are very much similar for this. One and this one and this one. They are different from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Even though after fourth generation, but still, this one is similar, but this one is totally different from this one, right? So the scheduling of uh, energy allocation is, is is written in, I don't know, maybe just the way to, uh, you know, protein, I mean, messenger RNA activation uh, or something. And that is, uh, inherited too, so that uh, 
except uh, DNA, DNA part, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, the rest of this cell chemical part can be inherited. Maybe it's a initial, initial state, or uh, yeah, maybe the, the initial uh, configurations of a chemical components surrounding the DNA can be the media for the uh, non-DNA non inheritance, I think. But I'm not sure, you know, that, that's why I, we are looking into this RNA set, single cell RNA set to see whether there is some, some media that can carry non-DNA inheritance possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a question also regarding the kinetic energy distribution. Uh, so it, it's more of a curiosity thing, and I don't know if you did this in the lab or not, but uh, you showed the difference between uh, the Petri dish, which had the individuals from the same ancestor, and the other one, which had the individuals from different ancestors, right? Yeah. And you showed how the kinetic energy is different in both Petri dishes. But then, like, I would also think that maybe there is just something in the bitry, in this bitry dish that's different from the bitry dish. So, like, have you done uh, the experiment where you try to allocate the individuals from one bitry dish to the bitry dish of another group? So that's it's that, like all the, the the whole eight in another. So that to see if the influence is actually, or the the difference in kinetic energy is actually due to the uh, environment itself, or is it due to the genetics? I agree. We should do that. You know. Um, for the moment, we don't have the technique to uh, pick up one of those cells to bring it to the other petri dish. Well, yeah, definitely that's uh, something that will happen. Okay, yeah, because uh, like I also thought maybe it's different. Like I'm not a microbiologist, so I don't know how to do it. But then when you mentioned that there were different individuals from different ancestors, I thought maybe there is a way to do it. Or so kind of like... is, we are just always you know, video recording everything, and okay. then in, by the by the unit is a deep neural net. That, that they can identify each individual, can track everything, so that we can calculate kinetic energy. But physically picking up one individual and then putting into another petri dish is uh, something else, right? Okay. So uh, yeah, but uh, your question is is, is is very much like a crucial one. Yeah, I okay. have to do that. Okay. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, if you know any, you know, good way to do that, please. Oh, I, I wish I'm not a microbiologist at all, so I have no idea. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in these experiments, there's a small guys when you like increase the number of the small creatures, the size of the dish was the same. Yeah. So like the density also was changed. So did you like try to like, take big dish or something like this? I haven't tried that. So uh, maybe the size effect, size matters. But uh, yeah, uh, it is a high 800 micrometers. Mm -hmm. And then the microbe is much smaller than this. So I would think that. But it's like relatively small. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what was it? Right, uh, so, um, <clears throat> it's about uh, 40 micrometers. So, um, yeah, may or may matter. I don't know. Yeah, but you're right. So, uh, we also have to check with the, with the larger size petri dish. Yeah. Okay. So, now five, ten. So, okay. I think, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.